Psalm 8, 3 to 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Amen. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity when we can come together to talk about coaching and the joys of coaching and all that coaching has meant in our lives. And now we invite the Holy Spirit now to speak to us and through us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture that I chose to read today is Psalm 8, 3 to 5. is a very familiar scripture to, scripture to most of us. And I believe it relates to what we do in coaching. When I think about coaching, and I consider how coaching has shaped my life personally, this scripture more than any other comes to mind. For I believe that it relates to the one aspect of coaching that has had the greatest impact on my life. And that is adopting the coaching mindset and how adopting that mindset relates, changes how we relate to other people. Basically, my understanding is that the coaching mindset affirms that the persons that we are blessed to enter into a coaching relationship with are people who are created in the image of God. It is the understanding that human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made and as such are not broken and don't need to be fixed. The coaching mindset embodies the principle that the client is the subject matter expert when it pertains to anything about themselves, and it affirms that as such, the client possesses within themselves the solutions to the obstacles or the problems that they are facing. Now, as Lutherans, we know that confession is good for the soul, amen? And so I must confess that the coaching mindset was a foreign concept to me initially. I entered, I entered the pastoral ministry about 20 years ago because I wanted to help people. And I thought that helping people get into a right relationship with God would be the best way that I could do that. And so naively, I thought that all I would need to do to succeed in ministry was to have a basic understanding of the New Testament, a deep commitment to live my life in accordance with the gospel, and a willingness to help others to do the same. I thought it was that simple. In fact, I can remember joking during my seminary years saying to some of my friends that all we needed to do to obtain salvation was to read the red words and pray for power. I wish it was just that easy. But now I realize that when I entered the ministry, I was carrying some preconceived notions about human nature that were less than helpful. Although I was quite familiar with the words that David spoke in Psalm 8, words that suggest that human beings are created in God's image and made just a little lower than the angels. The coaching mindset was foreign to me because I was seduced by an unwavering belief in the doctrine of original sin. Because everywhere I looked, I saw the manifestation of the alienation that exists between humanity and God and within the human family itself. And so I came to see the people that I came in contact with as broken vessels in need of spiritual repair some obviously being more in need of repair than others. I was convinced that even though we are sinners, we are all redeemable because we have been created in the image of God and God doesn't make any junk. And so as I saw it, my job as a clergy person was simply to help make broken vessels whole again by leading people to Jesus, and by doing what Jesus did, which was preaching good news to the poor, binding up the brokenhearted and trying my best to set the captives free. I saw myself as a chief spiritual officer of a congregation who was responsible for answering all questions that a church member might have pertaining to theology or the church, and who could at the very least be the person who could direct other folks to resources that would provide the answers that I didn't have. But now, two decades later, I'm happy to say that coaching has changed me. 
because I have changed the way, because it has changed the way that I view people. Adopting a coaching mindset has been liberating for me in that it has revealed that the one that one does not need to function as a chief spiritual officer in order to help people. In other words, I don't need to try to fix people because they are not broken or act as if I'm equipped to answer all of the questions of life that they might have. I've learned that we can help people simply by listening to them, by being present with them, and by coaching. Now, instead of thinking about what I'm going to say while other folks are talking, Coaching has allowed me to be comfortable working in a space of not knowing. And for me, that's really big. Now I'm free to be an active listener, to be fully present with the client, to dance in the emotions of the moment as the client leads the conversation. I don't have to say a word. And so in the beginning of every coaching relationship, I'm careful to explain to the client that I'm operating with a coaching mindset which is undergirded by the unshakable belief that human beings are created in the image of God, that we are created just a lower lower than the angels. And most importantly, that God has placed within each of us, not only the capacity, but the potential to become the best versions of ourselves that we can be. Friends, I want you to know that our words have power. And I've found that simply voicing my belief in the client's wholeness an inherent capacity to do and become has had a Pygmalion effect on the coaching relationship, heightening the hopes and expectations that I have of my clients, which in turn heightens their hopes and expectations that they have of themselves and of the coaching process. Having the opportunity to help facilitate transformation in others has, as well as in myself, is the truly awesome aspect of coaching that is most rewarding for me. Thank you for listening.